Good morning. So lovely to see everyone back here today. Um, thank you for everyone for joining yesterday as well. It was such a rich discussion um, and so wonderful to connect with so many of you. Um, so yeah, welcome back to day two of our Climate Crossroads Summit. Um, I'm just going to take a moment um, for those of you who may be joining us just today in person uh, to uh, uh, orient you with the building. Um, in case that there is any sort of emergency, we're going to ask that you um, exit through the door you came in at the middle of the auditorium here. Uh, there are a few major exits to the, the building, but the easiest thing to do would be to proceed directly through the Great Hall and exit out through the um, uh, the uh, exit that goes out to Constitution Avenue. Uh, the restrooms are marked here in blue on the map. So if you exit the auditorium, head to the right, you can um, uh, uh, get to the facilities near the C Street entrance, or if you go into the Great Hall and to the left, um, you can find those opposite the East Court. And of course, if you're having trouble locating anything, just flag down one of the staff and um, they'll be happy to help you. And just wanted to walk through our plans for today. Um, we have um, two wonderful panels planned for during our um, plenary sessions here. We'll be getting started in just a minute with a panel on intersections of climate and other societal challenges. Um, after that panel, we'll be going into breakout sessions for those of you in person. Um, and we'll provide some instructions about where to go and how to do that at that point. Um, we'll have a lunch, and then we'll return back to the auditorium uh, for our final panel on emerging challenges and opportunities. I'm very excited about that one, too. Um, and we'll then close the day with some reflections and, and uh, just a few notes about our next steps for the climate crossroads. Um, again, we'll be um, live streaming the plenary pieces of the uh, agenda, and we have uh, the opportunity to participate through Slido. So if, if if you haven't already uh, gotten access to that, that's the QR code there, or you can go to the website and um, access it with that event code. Um, we'll also have some online prompts that if you guys, if anyone was on the Slido yesterday, there were a few surveys and other things that came, came up um, through the day. So I um, encourage you to participate in that as well. And so with that, I'm delighted to invite our uh, first panel to join me here on the stage. Come on up, thank you. And I think we're, we're waiting for one of our panelists to come, and so we, we might have one joining us in the nick of time. So we'll, we'll get started, uh, uh, Michael, and we'll go with that, okay? Thank you. Great. Yes. Good morning, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here uh, today. And this morning, we had a, a great conversations yesterday um, that really touched on the need and urgency of having the National Academies engage in these issues of climate at the, at the crossroads. My name is uh, uh, Michael Mendez. I'm an assistant professor of environmental policy and planning at the University of California, Irvine. I um, also have the pleasure and honor to be a part of the advisory uh, committee of the Climate Crossroads Initiative here for the National Academies. And uh, today we're gonna be elaborating a little bit more on topics and themes we talked about uh, yesterday around looking at populations uh, that are disproportionately impacted from our, our changing climate, and specifically marginalized communities, communities of color, uh, looking at issues of intersectionality. So we talked a lot bro broadly about these impacts, but we, we didn't get more explicit about who were these individuals, what communities are we talking about? And these are multiple communities, plural, that uh, we're gonna be highlighting here today and trying to put a, a more a human-centered, um, a human face to these impacts of climate change. So I'm honored to have a distinguished um, panel here that really shows the breadth of this sort of intersectional human-centered approaches or human dimensions approaches to climate change and its impacts and how communities are also responding um, and providing valuable input and uh, decision-making and innovation around climate change. So uh, uh, let me begin uh, with introducing uh, some of um, our panels. Today we'll be starting to hear from Jacoby Wilson, uh, who's the director of the Center for Community Engagement of Environmental Justice and Health. 
uh, and a professor at the Maryland Institute for Applied uh, Environmental Health at the University of Maryland, and he'll be joining us shortly. Miriam Gay Antaki, Assistant Professor of Geography and Environmental Studies at the University of New Mexico, and Hussam Mahmoud, the, the George T. Abel Professor in Infrastructure and Director of the Structural Laboratory at Colorado State University. Each of our panelists will offer some brief opening remarks to get us started, and then we will engage in a constructive conversation. We will also leave time for Q&A with the audience, both in person and online. For, the, uh, for those tuning in virtually, we encourage you to submit questions in the Slido box below uh, the live stream at any point in the session. And we'll have staff to help feed those uh, to the discussion here. So let's dive into our conversation this morning. And again, um, it's designed to push our thinking around how to conceptualize climate change impacts and po potential solutions and how they intersect with issues of race, gender, class, age, immigration status, and other type of uh, demographic factors. And we really want to uh, dig in on what do these intersections mean for how we should approach finding equitable and effective solutions to climate challenges. So our, our panelists are working at these intersections and we'll explore these insights. So we're gonna begin with Miriam. Um, your work has really focused uh, especially on the intersection of gender and climate change and how societal structures shape the development and implementation of policies. Um, who participates in decision-making and how, to, how people take up those decisions. We'd love to he uh, hear your perspectives uh, from the ground, from your research and your field work on these intersectional approaches to uh, climate challenges and solutions. And thank you for being with us here today. Thank you so much for that introduction, Michael. Yes, so I, I study intersections of gender and climate change, but very broadly, I'm interested in power relations around knowledge production around climate change. So if I lose you along the way, the key takeaway of my research and of what I want to get through today is that we must step away from one-size-fits-all solutions that are devised by people who think similarly. So my research explores processes by which some voices are heard and some are silenced in the climate debate. I analyze this not only at the community or local level, I think there's some issue there of calling something local. I think there's a lot of local spaces, even in, in what we think of as international spaces. Uh, so I, I go and look at um, power dynamics in scientific spaces, such as the drafting of reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, to climate policy meetings, such as the Conference of the Parties, and definitely I, I try to assess or evaluate the impact of the science on the policy in the communities where that are targeted where our tar these projects are targeted. And I have found that unless we focus on the intersections of structural inequalities and climate-related pressures, our knowledge around climate change remains incomplete and we will fail and we have failed to build resilient communities. So while climate change is the most pressing issue of our time and it has shown and it will, sh will continue to show differential impacts around gender, race, sexuality, class lines, and location and geography, um, gender uh, plays an ancillary role in how to think about the problem. So rather than just thinking about impacts, what I try to do with my research is to say we, if we use gender as an analytical category to study power relations, it would be much more powerful than just trying to assess how gender impacts some women in some parts of the globe. The problem around how gender is conceptualized in the climate debate is that it's usually very essentialized. It usually uh, is reduced to mean women versus men, but not even that, like in the discourse or, or in the um, Im image that we have, we usually, you know, imagine or, or a woman from the global south is depicted and uh, as uh, some having to go and collect uh, firewood, right, and walk further for that in the face of climate change. So then one of the solutions to uh, resolve gender inequality in the face of climate change would be the distribution of efficient wood stoves. But when I, what I try to stress is that not all women's lives will be improved by 
efficient with those, right? I mean, this is a bad joke, but some women might want uh, induction soaps, no? Uh, I mean, that's, it's a bad joke. Um, but some women don't even want any stoves. So that's sort of like one of the, the issues around how we're thinking about gender and climate change. Um, and so these simple short-sighted solutions really overlook the complicated and sophisticated web of intersecting barriers that women also face when accessing science policy and action. And this is why intersectionality is so important. It reminds us that a narrow focus on gender, right, just focusing on the women aspect constrains what we can know and do about climate change when other forms of social difference and, and oppression are important in how we think about climate change, responsibility, vulnerability, and governance of the problem. Yet, we pretend, um, or, or we, in, in terms of how we use gender in the climate change debate, this is not the case. And I'll just give you an example from my research. I was at the Conference of the Parties in Lima, Peru, and I attended the Women and Gender Constituency, which, are, which is um, the constituency that is responsible to advocate for women in climate change. And I observed how a young woman was asked to read a speech that was written by the leadership of the constituency, yet these women had not been participant in writing the uh, the speech and this speech was going to be given uh, to the entire plenary to the entire conference of the parties and while she accepted that she had no decision making influence in that report but her body served as this visual representation of the mainstream mainstream gender and climate change narrative there was no discussion of whether she agreed or what the, she thought of the speech and there was also no space in the constituency to argue or to to think about how gender could be operationalized in that space so while it is key that the constituency does the, exist in the gender debate in the conference of the parties because otherwise gender would be completely forgotten the way that it is allowed in needs to um, be very uh, domesticated, it, it, there needs to be one single message that needs to be palatable for such a space. So rather than using gender as um, a tool to sort of like challenge the structures, it actually has to be fit into a mold, right? And this mold is very rigid. And I think, you know, we, we've mentioned this uh, implicitly, but I'm just going to talk about this explicitly. The structures that shape the mold are patriarchal, colonial, and capitalist. And if we do nothing to change these structures, then the messages that go in there will have no, no real impact, right? But we pretend that we can achieve climate justice without changing these structures. We pretend we can achieve climate justice without n challenging them. And this silencing does not only occur at the conference of the parties and with gender, it can happen from an IPC scientist um, that feels unheard because of their gender, race, location, command of English, or whatever knowledge that they want to say about climate change to the impact of their lack in, of knowledge in the science to how it's going to be implemented in the policy to how it will hit the ground. So I use feminist and decolonial insights in my work because these are key to understand patriarchy and colonialism, right? It's the feminist and the decolonial uh, scholarship that is key here. And these um, highlight the intersecting systems of domination um, that really maintain oppressive and exploitative relations, creating different opportunities for women and people of color that exclude them from actively participating in the debate. So I'll, I'll just end here. So it, you know, this scholarship has shown time and again that knowledge produced without women and people of color remains incomplete. And thus, it's, it's it, you know, we are then at a disadvantage when this exclusion of people uh, continues. So, thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Mary. That was an excellent overview and introduction to this issue of intersectionality, power relations, and uh, systemic inequalities. And I really appreciate you pushing scholars, practitioners, and other experts to move away from reductive lo logics, particularly when studying uh, gender, women, um, and disproportionate climate impacts. 
and trying to tackle the larger structural inequalities. And it reminded me of critiques of what is happening in Bangladesh with the flooding and women. And the, the newspaper headlines were, these women are said to be, because of the flooding, forced into human trafficking. And then, but people are pushing back. It's the existing inequalities before these climate-induced disasters happen that are making these disproportionate impacts exasperated when a, a disaster like extreme storms and flooding do, do occur. So thank you for that and look forward to hearing more about your intersectional approaches to uh, climate change research. Ne and like to welcome our third, our third panelist, uh, Shikobi, um, that uh, will be speaking to us momentarily. Uh, but next I'll move on to uh, Hussam. And I'm really interested in hearing about your work, which focuses on the intersection of communities and the built environment, and specifically on resilience to and recovery from extreme events. As we imagine an increase in the frequency and intensity of these events with climate change, tell us how, you're, how you think about the intersections you see in the social, built, and natural environments as people face these challenges. And thank you for coming. Thank today. you so much for the kind invitation to be part of this panel and uh, offer maybe some thoughts um, on this very interesting topic. So I, I think as a community for us to be um, talking about climate and the interface between climate and societies, in my opinion, is the first step that we need to have to be able to find solutions to the problems we're dealing with. Um, problems are very complicated. and uh, we all acknowledge this now, <clears throat> and it's interesting. Um, if you skim through the literature and start to look, we actually did this. We have a, a paper under review on this topic. We started to look on uh, at, at climate-related papers that have been published by four major publishers, which I would not mention the names, and we find that the word um, resilience, for example, adaptation, <clears throat> excuse me, and so on, is mentioned about. 30% or so in these papers, which is, which is really good. It's not great, but it's, it's, a, it's a good step. But then we looked further and, and tried to find uh, uh, papers that actually talk about risk-informed models or tools that might allow you to inform resilience and adaptations that are mentioned in these papers. And we found that only 2%, 1 to 2% of the papers have anything to do with, for example, Bayesian updating or functionality assessment or life cycle analysis. So we're talking quite a bit about complex problems and, and issues that relate to these complex problems, but tools to address them are, uh, in my opinion, lacking. And because they're lacking, we have to actually start to think about models that allows us to intersect social, um, physical, ecological, economic systems in a way that makes us able to, to develop uh, uh, decisions that are actually effective. And I'm not arguing that every single model has to be complicated, or that interface has always to be a complex interface. In some cases, it doesn't have to be. So I'll, maybe I'll give you a couple of thoughts or examples on, on maybe a simple versus a more complicated. Um, so take, for example, the idea of an incoming hurricane um, with sea level rise that is going to hit your community, and you're interested in looking at how the physical system behaves, uh, how damage will manifest itself in the community, and what the impact would be on the, the, the community, on people, on uh, which social uh, 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 groups or demographics would be impacted more. This, um, I, I'm a structural engineer by training, I can tell you this is a straightforward exercise. And despite the fact that it's straightforward exercise, it hasn't been done much. It has been done, but not to the level that you would think it should be. So that's number one. And that's an example of a straightforward idea of that, what that interface would look like. Another, what I would call also an obvious interface, but to my shocking surprise, it wasn't done at all. And the reason why I know it wasn't done is because when we started to do it, we didn't find anything in the literature. Take, for example, the sea level is rising. There's saltwater intrusion, and that saltwater intrusion makes its way into the groundwater. Now the groundwater has chloride in it, and that rising groundwater, because the groundwater follows the sea level rise, hits your foundation from the bottom and causes the tremendous deterioration to foundations. Now, every time you, you find somebody who's talking about hurricanes or talking about extreme events, they talk about damage from the outside of the building, right? Which what we see, but that, what I would call slow death that we're not paying attention to is very important. And there hasn't been any studies 
that looked at this. And, and when we looked at it, we found tremendous impact on marginalized communities in, in, in Mobile, Alabama. It's one, one of the areas we looked at. So these, again, that's in my opinion, is straightforward in the sense it's not difficult to do. It, it's tedious, it requires time, but somebody has to think about it, right? Now, there are examples of much more complex system interaction that we have no choice but to do it because there is no other way to develop effective policies without this complex system interaction. So, for example, consider, healthcare, consider for example, healthcare systems, which we're working quite a bit on healthcare systems. So, in order for you to model healthcare system functionality, you have to include what we call the three S's, um, space, staff, and supplies. And so, obviously, the, 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 the staff is, is a social component of your element. The space is the physical system infrastructure and the supplies. But when you talk about, for example, the physical system, the infrastructure, we're not just talking about a hospital building by itself. We have to look at all supporting infrastructure, power network, water network, transportation network, telecommunication network. And we when we consider the staff, we're not just thinking of how many people are are working at the hospital, we have to actually look at damage to their homes. Can they come to work or not? Can they actually drive to work because the transportation network is not functioning, right? If the homes are damaged, would they even stay in the community? And if the homes are not damaged, are the homes functional? Do they have power and water and so on? Do they have to move somewhere else? So it becomes a very complicated system, even with the supplies. You need to look at supplies availability. Not just medical supplies, but also food, contamination to food, for example. Um, um, you know, I, I don't know if people know this, but Puerto Rico is essentially the, the, mo most of the production of the IV bags that we use in our hospitals in the mainland in the U.S. are produced in Puerto Rico. So when Puerto Rico is hit by a hurricane, that impacts the IV bag supplies in the U.S. And not to mention another event that we get somewhere in the U.S., right, that compounds this uh, uh, lack of supplies. So it's a, it's a very complicated system, and we have to think about it this way. Education systems are very similar, by the way, and I'm not going to get into the education systems, but interdependencies between healthcare system and education system has not been looked at. And this is very critical. In, it, without education system, you can, people cannot send their kids to schools, and if you cannot send, the, send them to schools, they cannot go to work. So coupling of education system, in my personal opinion, with all other systems, period, is key to start to address some of these issues related to recovery. And of course, when you talk about the education system, there's a lot of complexities there as well. Again, I'm not arguing everything has to be complicated, but I'm saying we have to embrace this complexity when needed in order for us to develop these effective solutions that allows us to have these lever, lever arms that we can play with, not only for physical infrastructure, but also for the social component of the functionality and resilience and for the economic and, and, and so on. So um, I think there's a lot for us to do. Well, I, I don't think we're there yet when people talk about, we have solutions and we have some solutions we can implement, but we're absolutely far from finding the right solutions and we need to just keep hammering this idea, idea of complex system. Thanks a lot. Great, thank well, you. Uh, thank you that I really appreciate you bringing in those ideas of how do we have a re resilience frame, focus on solutions, and specifically, how do we analyze um, uh, these communities that are really engulfed in uh, complex systems and complex problems and have sort of um, a domino effect of, uh, for the rest of the nation. So I look forward to hearing more examples of um, your intersectional approaches uh, to uh, marginalized communities or multiple communities. So next, uh, we're going to hear from Shakobi. It's, it's nice to meet you. I've, I've seen a lot of the events that you've been in. I think we've been on a couple uh, of them together and great to have you here and really interested in um, hearing about your work since it's focused on engaging and partnering with communities around issues of environmental justice and health um, such as air quality and water quality. Many of these issues stem from historic and, and current racism. How do you think about the intersection of race, class and other factors that result in disproportionate impacts of climate on health and well-being in many communities of color? Yeah, thank you, and hopefully you can hear me already. Sorry for being late. Uh, Murphy's Law went to the wrong building. So I went to the other <laughs> building. So I was on time there. I <laughs> jumped with the uh, Lyft driver. So um, that's why you need to double and triple check, folks. So when you think about these issues, you know, I, I think you can't, at least in the U.S. context, and I, ha I have a, a undergraduate EJ Scholars program and, and a climate justice scholars program, and, and we talked recently about, you know, you have to understand the social, cultural, and social political processes 
that, that drive, you know, kind of these disproportionate impacts. And it could be overlapping process across countries. But what are the things that undergird? What are the root causes? So if you think about, you know, for me, the climate change, you cannot really get at uh, addressing climate change without addressing racism, in my opinion. And so if you think about in the U.S. context, because of the history of, you know, you, you know segregation, you know, redlining, you know, Jim Crow 1.0, 2.0, you can look at the founding of this country, I like to say in my lectures, you know, the stolen lands of our indigenous brothers and sisters, one of the lands right now, that I think that the Scottaway people, uh, and the stolen bodies of my African ancestors, right? That, that uh, legacy still uh, lives today. You, the uh, panelists talked about Mobile. Y'all know Africa town in the Clotilda. You know, that community uh, was, was, is surrounded by industry. It's an example of what I call environmental slavery. So you were impacted by slavery, right? And then you actually, they're using that community to host these hazards. They wouldn't put any other part of the mobile, right? So that's an example of the connections, the legacy, uh, you know, historic racism and contemporary racism. We know the work of Shondas and others when it comes to red line and, and heat issues and urban heat islands, right? And how you, how you see differential temperature uh, levels in areas that are red line versus non red line areas. We know the history of uh, the Federal Highway Act uh, um, and, and, and how those highways and byways were built through black and brown communities. So now you look at impervious surfaces, uh, the amount of concrete and asphalt, and you wonder why some places stay hotter than other places. One of my colleagues, Dr. Lawrence Brown, wrote a book on Baltimore called The Black Butterfly. So those of you who know about Baltimore, from Baltimore, driven through Baltimore, the, bu the, uh, the wings are hyper-segregated with folks of color. Okay, The body of the butterfly are primarily white, uh, wealthy residents. So the hyper-segregated areas with folks of color, that's where you have lower home values, you have more lead cases, right? You have more air pollution, you have more issues with heat, you have more poverty, and so you can see the associations between, you know, segregation and redlining and heat, poverty, health. Uh, there was a study done a few years ago by students from a college of journalism at University of Maryland at, on Baltimore in a project called Code Red. And they went and they did community science and put up temperature sensors. And, you know, we talk about the differences, uh, you know, in the butterfly wings versus the body when it comes to temperature. But even on the same block in some of the neighborhoods, just the power of one tree, they've shown that 20 degree to 30 degree differences in temperature when you have a tree. And y'all know trees are great for a lot of things. Heat mitigation, stormwater mitigation, noise pollution mitigation, right, air pollution mitigation, uh, playability, mental health, et cetera. Uh, I like to go, and I know I don't have a lot of time, I talk about my own house where I have a micro farm. I grow stuff, I mean, growing food, having a food force, that's the important of those things. And if you think about, you know, environmental justice and going to my uh, fellow panelists about resiliency, uh, Antonovsky talks about salutogenesis. So how they promote health, well-being, and wellness across all elements of the environment, built environment, you know, natural environment, economic, social environment, political environment, the spiritual environment. If you really want to have a frame to address these issues in the communities I'm talking about, you really have to apply a solution framework. Environmental justice framework is that. The 17 principles of environmental justice are really about the people, uh, you know, really driving change. One principle talks about self-determination. In those 17 principles, uh, we talk about human rights, sustainability, you know, Mother Earth, right? We talk about indigenous peoples. We talk about worker rights. That framework is very much a framework that will be very useful because uh, it's very intersectional. And it gives you a, a comprehensive framework for actually uh, how the community driven solutions. So we're going to address this issue of intersectionality, right? You, you really have to think about, you know, I like to say that, you know, climate change impacts all of us, but you may not believe in climate change, but it believes in you if you're poor, if you're black, if you're Latino, if you're an Asian Pacific Islander, if you're indigenous, if you're living on the floodplain, right? If you have underlying health issues, if you're dealing with health disparities, if you don't have health insurance, if you're uninsured, if you, you know, if you don't, if you don't have a lot of resources and infrastructure, look at the Pope's encyclical. I'm gonna bring a little bit of religion in uh, on climate change. That encyclical talks about climate change, not really. It talks about the poor. It talk, there's really not a lot of the use of the term climate change in encyclical. It talks about the poor. How do we uplift the poor? So the idea is if you're gonna address, you know, climate change and the differential impacts from various climate hazards and perturbations, you have to prioritize those are most vulnerable, right? And those are most susceptible. That separate vulnerability from susceptibility, right? Susceptibility is intrinsic. So children and the elderly, susceptible populations. Vulnerable populations be those that have some extrinsic factors, economic and social vulnerability. So those of you in public health, we're talking about the social service health framework, right? So how do you address issues of transportation, unjust housing, right? 
unjust food systems, people are dealing with food apartheid. I'm going to use the word apartheid several times. Wait, just give me a second. Food apartheid, recreational apartheid, medical apartheid, right? Right? And that was exported from the states to South Africa. I'm from Mississippi, so we're talking about apartheid. I know apartheid like systems, right? So you got pollution politics are part of the problem, too. You got plantation politics. We're talking about societal changes. So politics, so where do the hazards go? Where did the landfill go? For why do all the landfills, incinerators, the chemical plants, the industrial hog for those of you in Eastern North Carolina, remember Hurricane Floyd and Hurricane Florence. But those of you who live down in Houston, Houston Ship Channel, why do all those petrochemical operations go in the poor black communities, the poor Hispanic communities? Why do our, the mining operations impact our indigenous brothers and sisters? What's happening to our low income white brothers and sisters that deal in Appalachia when it comes to extraction? So you think about all these communities that are being impacted, the intersectionality about power, right? how they've been disempowered, how they've been invisibilized by our policies. It's not by accident. For those of you who are planners, it's called planning, not accident, folks. It's not by accident. It's by design. So you think about these issues of how some communities, due to their race, due to their class, tend to be overburdened by these hazards. They have more risk when it comes to climate change. So we're going to address uh, climate change. We're going to really get to resiliency and our, our, our no, I'll speak more about this. We actually have to move beyond resiliency, too, because we expect these folks to always have to bounce back all the time. We have to do better. So how do we move beyond resiliency, use a salutogenic framework, and really have an empowerment framework? Now, and last point, when we talk about empowerment, not with the EM power, because we're not giving people power, helping them build power, helping them build their voice, helping them apply their voice, to make sure we have solutions that come from the people, that has to be the central focus if we're going to address climate change in the U.S. and abroad. Great, thank you for that, uh, and, and that uh, amazing uh, reminder of uh, having that people-centered approach and really uh, understanding that if we want to tackle climate change, um, environmental justice, climate justice, we have to tackle the root causes, racism, and other historic disinvestments. As you mentioned before, it's not by coincidence or accident that these communities are um, always at the front lines of uh, climate-induced disasters. It's because specifically urban planning by design and the historic disinvestment that has made these communities um, vulnerable. So um, thank you for that. And so we want to dig in a little bit more with some examples where you are providing some of these intersectional lens in practice that can make the, a, a concrete um, examples for our audience to understand what does an intersectional approach to climate change research and practice look like. So I'm going to be asking each of the uh, panelists can, uh, to talk a little bit from their own research experience on the ground, what that intersectional approach, again, moving away from these abstract notions of impact. Uh, abstract notions or homogenization of communities to really understanding who are who are these people putting a human face to these impacts. So we'll start with uh, you first, uh, Miriam. Thank you. Sure. I guess I'm, I, I use intersectionality in sort of like thinking about scale, right? So when thinking about gender, again, I stress it's not gender doesn't just occur on the ground in the global south, right? So when I look at gender and climate change, this is why I stress power relations around knowledge production because there is uh, gender relations everywhere. So this is why I focus in gender relations in science production, in climate policy, and on the ground, right? And then once you sort of like leave, leave this essentialized narrative around gender and climate change, then you have like to, to sort of like really be intersectional. Um, you need to incorporate race and class and sexuality. And in my work, this is why I use the decolonial framework because the de like it's you know it's feminist through and through. But the decolonial framework is very necessary because it really highlights how the world is not only divided by gender but it's also divided by race. Right. So then if you want to understand, if you want to be intersectional using gender, you have to think about race. Right. So if if, for instance, um, just like an example, I I have one from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and the responses from scientists there. And one of the research that I have conducted was a survey 
um, assessing women's participation and how they felt uh, writing or being part of their reports. And overall, like if you just look at the numbers, the statistics, I could have reported that most women or the majority of women think that it's great, right? That they feel represented and that they felt that they could talk. But once you sort of start digging in, once you also allow a different method of analysis, like more qualitative, once you sort of like allow a voice, you start seeing that there, that's not the case. There are many people that feel that they're not heard and they're not um, seen, and that and that's when you know their location starts coming up, their command of English, their race, their age starts coming up. So if you really want to say anything about any population, I mean, it's I, in a way I think the category of women is just a very complicated one because there are so many other um, systems above sort of like gender that sometimes are more important in oppression than than gender, right? So for instance, um, we can stay here in, in the United States, but um, uh, white women, uh, middle class, right? This was sort of like the second wave feminist movement. There was very little um, commonality with pe women of color uh, in the United States, right? They were like, well, our problems are not that we're staying home uh, and want like equal wage. Our problem is that we've always been working and there's no other option. So there's sort of, uh, there, there has to be, in, in order to be intersectional, you have to talk about both, well, at least, at least gender and race and of course there's sexuality and all sort of stuff here. Agreed. That, that, that's some excellent examples of how to look at those, those co complex issues within um, uh, communities and populations. Hussam, we'd love to hear a little bit uh, from your work. <clears throat> yeah, I, I mean, it's, um, this is interesting. Um, and I have a lot of thoughts on, on, on natural disasters and how they impact communities. But we, we you know, the Bring Back Mobile, uh, which we looked into uh, for some of our analysis, um, and this idea of looking at how sea level rise impacts the foundations of many homes, you know, for context, 50% of Mobile are African Americans and um, definitely socially very vulnerable. Uh, we looked at the social vulnerability in Mobile and we, we uh, find that 44% of people in Mobile uh, are age 65 and older and uh, low income. So it's, it's really not a good, uh, uh, you know, not a good situation for them. Um, and, and that idea of sea level rise, we found that the, the, the majority of the impact impacts uh, low income and, and vulnerable population, for sure. And um, interestingly, I was talking to one of, the, one of the people in Mobile who's really, this guy is amazing. And he's white, for, uh, by the way, then since we're talking about race and I give him credit. And he's doing a lot of this uh, without even getting paid. And he was telling me about some of the issues they're facing, talking about you know, starting with the communities and what the communities have to say. And I was shocked to hear that one of the main issues that they look at now is that they have certain areas of mobile that gets flooded all the time. And that flooding in that area causes a cemetery nearby to flood. And the bodies float that people have buried and this is not something I've ever thought about. You know, someone sitting in my office in Fort Collins thinking about, you know, how the power network um, interacts with the, with the transportation and the water and so on. And here's somebody telling me bodies are floating uh, uh, on the surface. And so I, I, you know, I was talking to him and I said, well, this is a very simple civil engineering problem. Uh, an undergraduate student at any university should be able to crunch the number and come up with some sort of design that says, this is how you guys, um, uh, you know, should, should mitigate this problem. And he said, nobody's helping us. So starting from the community, starting from the people to understand what their needs are, not necessarily, and this is a very important issue, not necessarily looking for them to provide solutions. The solutions have to be acceptable for the communities. They have to actually look at the solution and say, yes, we can do this. This is acceptable for us. But we need to listen to them to understand the issues. And we can start with this sort of ground level information from the communities to be able to build these sophisticated models that allows us to develop you know, solutions that, that are not necessarily intuitive, otherwise people would have done it already, and then say, hey, look, these are the solutions, right? Um, and I think doing it this way to understand the complexity uh, uh, of, of how different systems interface, giving uh, the need of the community is very important. But another example related to this, we actually looked at healthcare system in Mobile. 
And to your surprise, we, we ran Hurricane Katrina with sea level rise. We found that hospitals in Mobile in general are not near the coast, actually. They have like 36 hospitals, and, and healthcare is, is quite a big uh, um, sort of industry there. Not too many hospitals were impacted. And interestingly, the impact on the non vulnerable or social non vulnerable was higher. So I, I think we have to do th this together. We have to look at marginalized people, but we have to also look at non marginalized. They, they depend on each other. Somebody who's well off, who has a, a factory of some sort, and if that gets smacked and he or she would have to leave the community, then the socially vulnerable don't have places to go to work. We cannot just look at one group and, and leave the other. We understand that people are being marginalized, but we have to look at the whole community in order for us to develop system level solutions that work for everybody and, and keeps everybody safe. Great, well thank you for those points and I really appreciate you bringing in this idea of community engagement and collaborations as researchers and the research questions and putting communities at the forefront of not only identifying the problems, but being active participants in the solutions and mm -hmm. having those community voices integrated into the work that we do and that we, we engage with the policymakers at the same time to right. implement those solutions. Um, Jacoby, next we'd like to uh, end this question with you on your perspectives of uh, intersectionality and working uh, with uh, uh, diverse communities. Yeah, I like your last comment about community engagement. I could talk, uh, I'm not sure how much more time we have, I could go whine about, you know, just talk about that a lot. Um, so I think when you look at the work that we do, we do a lot. So I do way too much stuff, y'all. That's part of the reason why I need to be spoon fed, like, where's the location again? <laughs> but but um, just too much is going on. So we are, I've been doing a lot of work um, in, on the air quality side, building hyper local air quality monitoring networks. So what we usually do, you know, there are communities that are dealing with uh, air pollution issues. Of course, there's greenhouse gas associated with that, and also heat issues associated with that as well. So we're, we're, we have these networks. Uh, we're using purple wires. I know some of you may use a purple wire sensor for a particular matter. It's not the best sensor. It's a signal grade sensor. It's not a federal reference method, but it provides opportunity, at least as a starter sensor, uh, to give folks and, and, you know, understanding what they've been exposed to. We actually have captured some of the wildfire smoke, too, with our network, and then re done report back to our community partners. And so, you know, we build these partnerships and we build these networks in collaboration with community. We train residents to be community scientists so they know how to use the sensors, they can uh, deploy the sensors right, and also uh, check. We do a lot of uh, co-location for calibration purposes. We, so a lot of technical stuff, y'all, but I think that's an important way to bring in communities, and we're working with people across age ranges, so we work with youth. We have a, um, we have a Prince, we, we're doing a monitoring at some of the Prince Richard County high schools. We have some uh, Latino youth that we've engaged in the past in, 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 in air quality monitoring. As I mentioned before, we have an undergraduate EJ Scholars Program, so we're engaging folks who come from various communities, different uh, racial ethnic backgrounds, who come from these communities, and they're learning about uh, these projects. From a religion perspective, we, we have a project where we're doing air quality monitoring with the AME Church, United Church of Christ. Uh, one of my long-term partnerships, again, bringing the religion as well, uh, and also looking at the intersection of uh, race, class, and religion, we're working with a, a, a Muslim group, black Muslim group in uh, Charleston. I've worked with them since 2007. They're the Low Country Alliance for Model Communities. The Port of Charleston, think about goods movement, you know, greenhouse gases, think about all the goods movement issues y'all in the country that we have, uh, whether it be airports, coastal ports, uh, river ports, uh, warehouses, intermodal facilities, and the greenhouse gas emissions and impacts from those. So I've been working with them for a long time. So we, we really do a lot of work to get tools into the hands of the community. And I, and I said before, we do empowerment science. So we, we help build capacity so communities can do their own work. We also have developed some screening tools. Some of y'all may be familiar with US EPA EJ screen or CQ's uh, climate economic justice screening tool. We developed a Maryland EJ screening tool. We built the climate equity health mapping tool for the state of Maryland. We built the park equity mapping tool for the state of Maryland. We're building a, a climate equity mapping tool for the Region 3 to EPA. We've also worked with the National Academies on their grand challenges, their climate communities network, probably talk about that in another session, and help to do some mapping there. So mapping tools, what we call public participatory GIS, PPGIS, is a big thing that we do as well. In addition, we've done a lot of photo voice with communities. Again, another way to bring in qualitative data, photo voice that can collect uh, data on stormwater impacts, right? Uh, also looking at food justice issues. So it's a set of tools that we can use to empower communities, collect data related to uh, climate, you know, climate issues, and then use that data to inform policy. And I'll say this last point, because I know where it looks like we're out of time. So last point, 
We also, because you said it, uh, engage policymakers. We work with communities. I'm a co-founder of the Mid-Atlantic Justice Coalition, Delaware, D.C., Maryland, Virginia. Um, Delaware, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, primarily. We haven't gotten to Pennsylvania, West Virginia yet, or not New Jersey yet, but we're trying to. But we, we work with our legislators on bills. So we take a lot of the data to inform bills. So we work with community on these issues, and we work with legislators on bills and on policy. So I'll stop there, but I think that that's the structure, and that's replicable, and that's scalable. The, what I just outlined uh, on those multiple projects. Thank you for that. Uh, such exciting and important and significant work you're doing um, across sectors uh, from academia, uh, teaching to um, working with community partners and of course uh, policy makers. So thank you for that work. And I think we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, oh, 20 minutes. Okay, perfect. So then I can ask, I'm going to ask one more uh, question and then we're going to go to audience in person and online. So we're here today uh, with these two-day event to launch the, the National Academy's Climate Crossroads Initiative. And each of you provide an important perspective as scholars and experts and community advocates as well on um, integrating climate change uh, research and action with uh, diverse voices and community perspectives. As the National Academies rolls out this new initiative um, across um, the, the, the various academies to engage communities, uh, what type of uh, advice would you give uh, the president of the National Academies as well as the advisory committee and all the pro uh, program officers? Let's start with uh, Hussam first. So, yeah, that's, a, that's actually not an easy question. So I guess you could make recommendations for internally uh, within the academies in terms of how the academy functions and, and how they, they seek to perhaps um, you know, look deeper into the, the climate issues, but and, and also ex, uh, externally. And I'll start with internally first, and I think the academies are, in my personal opinion, having been observing, you know, the different workshops and different co convening they have been, uh, uh, that have been taking place. The academy is doing a great job interfacing different programs within the academies. And I think that's important when we talk about complex societal issues, and you can't just work in silos even within the academies. And that's happening. Uh, uh, not to the level that I think it, 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 it should be at, but it definitely sitting in that direction, which, which seems that that's where they, they want to go. Um, underground with communities, I think it's critical that um, they engage with the communities first. Define the problems. You know, there's, again, there's a lot of workshops and convening and, and summits and things like that. Engage with communities to define the problems, what their needs are, and then establish maybe discussions around these. I know that in some, some of the programs within the National Academies have funding for research, maybe surveys or things like that. Um, if, even, even conduct massive surveys um, across different states and communities to look at a specific issue. So for example, if you look hypothetically at the healthcare issue, right? What are, the main, what are the main elements or main components that people are considering when they talk about healthcare and climate change or health disparities and climate change? And if you have you know, surveys that would go out and, and collect feedback from communities, that would actually inform some of these complex models that I was talking about. And I'll tell you how we started, because we didn't start with the community. We went online, we looked at all the news articles that talks about dysfunctional healthcare or, or problems, and so we collected all these online news articles that tell you what the main issues are, and we started to take these little pieces and build our model with it. So maybe we can do better if we can go to the communities from the beginning and ask them what was the main issue with your hospital or, or system. I found out later that one of the main problems with hospitals in flooding events is actually the basement flooding because the basement is with, with the laundry machines are. And if you don't have any laundry, then you shut, you shut down because obviously, um, Everything has to be clean. So let's start today with communities and then, yeah, and then build it up. And, and I think the National Academies have a major role uh, to help with that. Great. Next, what, uh, go to Shakobi. Yeah, so do not reinvent the wheel. Please don't do that. There are a lot of folks, I mean, um, uh, I was part, part of a group with the uh, Association of Schools of Public and Public Programs, and we did a, a framework on climate and health. And a big part of that framework is talking about research, you know, training and practice. And, you know, I'm on the more the action side, the more the practice side. So that community engagement, I think, is on the practice side. There's a lot of infrastructure that's already out there. And I think it's important to engage with that infrastructure. So you think about 
uh, some of the associations that are out there, like the American Public Health Association, their infrastructure. Uh, you have AGU, American Geophysical Union, their infrastructure. They're doing some work in the space. Speaking about a lot of uh, President Biden's executive order 14608, as we move from dirty energy economy to clean energy economy, 40% of those benefits should go to disadvantaged communities. That's like the Justice 40 framework. That's other, of course, executive orders on climate change. A lot of this led to uh, new dollars and more infrastructure out there, right? So, for example, you have the environmental finance centers. You may know about them, you may not. They're doing a lot of work to provide financing to expand access to sewer and water infrastructure. So, you think about that's a big deal, talking about infrastructure. You look at the EPA's Tic Tac program. Uh, Thriving Communities Technical Assistance Center, TCTAC. I'm the uh, co-director of the Region 3 Tic Tac of the EPA. That's infrastructure that you can engage with. Uh, Waverly Street Foundation, other founders like Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and many others, Kresge, they're, doing, they're funding a lot of uh, climate action hubs, community-based hubs, community climate partnerships. So connect to the infrastructure that's already out there and then bring additional resources or uh, expertise to fill the gap in those infrastructures. And then as it relates to the federal family, you know, of course, there's a lot of work happening, as I said earlier, with, at the federal family level. So how can you be an asset, an ally to the federal family as they implement, you know, develop their climate change program, doing that modeling? So whether it be NOAA, whether it be FEMA, whether it be EPA, Healthy Human Services, there's a lot of opportunity to engage with the family family as, as, as well and being a uh, you know, partner network. And then we'll end this question with Miriam. Um, I guess I would say um, that science is not neutral. And um, science has uh, been constructed by power relations. And while it can um, mitigate and uh, help us adapt to climate change, it can also exacerbate difference. Like, it, you know, historically, science has been extremely violent toward women and people of color. And so if in this sort of like era of like technology and uh, technocratic solutions uh, toward fixing societal problems, if we're not, not, not it's not about remembering because this, um, Structures are continuing today, but we, if we just pretend that science is neutral, um, that's one of, I think, the first issues. And this is why I take a little bit of a step back when we're talking about the difference between knowledge between communities and scientists, because I think that knowledge, uh, communities are knowledge producers, right? So there's some value there in trying to think about what would it mean if we put both types of knowledges like on the same platform, right? Just because you don't have the resources that a scientist might have in a lab, lab or, or, or doesn't mean that their knowledge is more valuable. I think what needs to be assessed here is why is their knowledge more valuable and why is that sort of like the legitimate way of knowing, right? And when we're thinking about who's the scientist, we think of like the normative image that comes to mind, right? Like when I tell you scientists, right? Maybe I think most of us might think of like a white Western male. So I think it's really pushing back against who's the knowledge producer and how we're legitimating that and how we're not pushing back against who's allowed to know, who's allowed to be the subject and who is the object, then it will be very difficult to resolve the crisis. Thank you for that. Uh, quite important to understand that having diverse knowledges um, on, on these committees and these processes, actively centering uh, these communities is quite important. And also acknowledging the work that we do. Um, many of us work in the communities. And we talked about this yesterday a, a, a little bit. The academy, the, um, our schools oftentimes don't value uh, this type of work. It takes longer. Um, it's, it, it's a heavier lift as scholars to engage in this work and uh, changes need to be made to continue to support this and, and ensure that many of our universities are able to facilitate uh, some of this work and uh, be pushing the envelope as well. So we have about 10 minutes left, so um, I have more questions, but I'd like to give the audience a chance to ask our esteemed panel um, some direct questions. So. Uh, the person uh, right here in red. Yes. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Hi. My name is Renee Collini. I'm with the Gulf Center for Equitable Climate Resilience, and I've been working on um, applied 
applying climate science work and specifically climate resilience in the Mississippi and Alabama Gulf Coast for the past 15 years, so I was excited to hear a lot of examples from that region. Uh, one of the things that jumped out at me, though, was your comment about the need for more tools and models. And so working on the ground, that is the opposite of what we've been told. People do not want more tools. I actually built a tool for climate resilience tools called Gulf Tree just to help as a demand from our partners to help them sift through what knowledge exists and how it can be applied. And so I'm curious if y'all could speak to the intersection of diversity, equity, power dynamics in science delivery and making sure that we're not just turning to let's produce a model or a tool and throw it out there and how that all comes together. Yeah, and in, in general, I would wholeheartedly agree with you that there's a really good number of models and tools out there. I'm, I'm not obviously talking, I'm, I'm not in a position to assist every single one of these tools, but you know, I, I can tell you that, uh, and I can understand completely why communities say that, because there's a lot of tools, but has anything happened to change? Absolutely not. We still have the same disproportional impact. We still have the same level of damage. We still have the same problems and they haven't seen anything improve. So if I was them, I'd say, I don't want any more tools. That's actually absolutely a valid point. But I can tell you from the work I do, we absolutely have almost none. So I can even elaborate further. You know, the impact of extreme events on the belt environment is very poorly understood, you believe it or not. The only hazard that we understand really well is actually earthquakes. Beyond that, we don't have a really good understanding of how extreme events impact the belt environment. I would say after earthquakes, maybe wind, um, uh, uh, sustained wind, for example. Um, tornadoes are not well understood that much. Hurricanes, a little bit. Wildfires, none. There is absolutely nothing that will tell you. And, and I'm not talking about even interfacing different layers of social infrastructure, so just damage to the belt environment. There's nothing that tells you aside from recent work that I'm familiar because we've done it. We just received a very, very large grant uh, to, to push the work further. We can now tell which building will be damaged in a wildfire event. But aside from that work that we, we started, there was nothing. So, so communities can say we don't want any more tools because they're not seeing any change. But in reality, we need more tools that allows us to understand how the impact would manifest on the community and what is the best way to the, actually to develop solutions. Because when we don't have resources, it's not, you know, we can't just, up, you know, we don't have the money to apply solutions. And wildfire is a very important, uh, uh, actually one I'll mention really quickly. The reason why wildfire are very important is that when you actually mitigate one building or remove a tree somewhere, that impacts the risk to another building or tree a few blocks down the road. And if people say, I don't want any more, you know, models, it's because they're frustrated with what they see, but without a model that can tell you what happens when you harden the structure, move this tree, what happens to the whole community, you can make decisions. So your point is really well taken. Um, and I, I was hoping we could move past maybe the making of the tool to the other space, because field of dreams really hurt us. If you build it, they will not come. That is not how that works. And so how do we make sure that mm -hmm. as our science and our knowledge advances, how do we deliver that in an equitable and empowered way? Yeah, it, it has to be done equitably and we have to do it with the community. You know, we have to, I mean, we can present them with solutions based on a very complex model, but they have to accept it, you know, um, but, but yeah, I, me, I agree. Yeah. Let, let me jump in because I know we're getting low on time. So I think the communication part is really important. I'm gonna say this one point and I'm gonna say something that's probably bad, but I'm gonna say one point. So I'm an editor in chief of the journal Environmental Justice. We finally got an impact factor, whoopee. Okay, for me, when it comes to science communication, uh, in the words of Yoda, peer review publications not science communication make. So if you're going to communicate science and really have impact, you got to take that information from the tools to actually communicate in a way that actually has impact. The best way to communicate is not a peer review publication. <laughs> it's directly talking to the decision maker. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of the problem, the tools right. that have been used. We're not actually, you, the advocacy and organizing to, to have the impact and the fit for purpose of the tools and the organizing, advocacy, and communication to get the impact is what's missing. And that's why you have a lot of frustration, particularly companies I've worked with. So I'll, I know we get low on time, so I'll stop there. I, I think that was an excellent answer. Thank you for that. Right, we'll go here. I think you have an online question or? Is no, it your uh, Andy Revkin, uh, not online. Uh, okay. for, I've been writing about this stuff since the 1980s, uh, mostly for the New York Times. My biggest mistake was, was writing all my stories about climate change and not about climate risk meaning putting risk in the foreground. And I was on the committee helping to design the pathway to this initiative. I wanted to get your reaction, the panelists, because this is a fantastic panel and it really reveals 
to me, the importance of going forward from in the, at this crossroads right. to centering on climate risk. There actually should have been an intergovernmental panel on climate risk, mm. with climate change being one driver of risk. And I just want to get your sense of that. You, you remind me so much of the work of Destiny Knock at Carnegie Mellon, who from Arizona to Pittsburgh has shown that energy poverty, for example, which can come from you know lack of even fossil fuel energy, uh, people who are poor, households who are poor, turn off their air conditioners or leave them off, and they die quicker than people who are not poor. So, so if you start with risk, and trying to make it an intersectional conversation around climate change, which to me feels like it misses the simplicity that comes from starting with risk. Risk is the hazard, heat, flood, whatever. Times exposure, how many people, and factoring in their vulnerability, susceptibility, or, or resilience. And so I just want to get your sense of whether that, if you, for the next 10 years, if you wanted to focus on policy information, informing policy, would you start with climate change, wedging in these other things, or would you start with climate risk? Uh, I know we're low on time. I'll say real quickly, focus on differential climate risk. And I was in the EPA uh, workshop a few months ago. We talked about climate communications. And it was a, and a big part of this. How do you tell the narratives that's, uh, that's a positive narrative? The world is going to end. If you're already dealing with environmental justice being poisoned every day, that doesn't help me out. Give me some mitigation. Give me some solutions. So talk about risk, but bring in mitigation, solutions, and some hope in your narrative. I'll stop there. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I, I think that's an important point to move away just from problems to a solution-based approach and then really enjoying uh, uh, the change in uh, the news media about uh, solutions-oriented journalism but it's, as it's, well. But it's, I'm asking a slightly different question. So not, see, it ends up being about solutions to climate change, not solutions to but you reduce vulnerability. Risk. Solutions to how you reduce risk, and to reduce the risk, you have to still get the root causes. Your example is still getting at, at root causes. So you have to address races. You have to address the social terms of health. You, you, you can't address the symptoms. We're doing stuff on the surface. You got to get to the root cause. To get to the root cause, it's, it's harder to do, right? <laughs> can, can I just offer a quick comment on this? This is a great point. And, and you know, wildfire is a perfect example when you, when you look at it. When you look at communities, and, and we don't understand how the probability of ignition interfaces with vulnerability to give you the risk that you're talking about. So, for example, you have a community that Probability of ignition is very high, right? Because there's a lot of heat and there's a lot of human activity, but the fire is not going anywhere. There's no wind, homes are spaced apart, there's very little vegetation, risk is very low, right? Why should we worry? That's not how we look at things now. Because as I mentioned earlier in my remarks, we're focused primarily on the hazard. We're not focused on how the hazard interfaces with with, with the ex exposure and, 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 and so on and to, to determine risk. And you might have a community where ignition probability is very low, but if it starts, the whole community is gone, right? So we need to look more into risk and to be able to develop these effective policy, policies to lower the risk. Yeah. Great, point. great. Thank you. Um, and I think we have time for one more quick question. The question is, um, and, and I thank you for the panel, I want to take the intersectionality one step further. Um, and I like the reference to Pope Francis's Laudato Si on Care for Our Common Home encyclical. He talked about integral ecology. We can't talk about just the environment or just people. We have to be talking about everything together, the systems. And I want to find out what is the role or what's the perceived role or future role or current role of the Climate Crossroads Initiative and academia in general in helping us address the problem of livelihoods. And I have a couple of examples. One is if we see any documentary on Amazonia, after ooing and eyeing of all the beautiful, wondrous stuff, inevitably towards the end, there's a dude with a chainsaw cutting it all down. He's not doing it out of malice. He's trying to make a livelihood. Currently, in the Colombian Amazon where I work, the people I work with have been having trouble selling their fish because the narco market is down. People aren't buying as much coca for a, var a variety of reasons. And because the narco trafficking is collapsing momentarily, the whole economy is collapsing. So the question really comes down to how is the role, what is the role of academy in addressing that central problem of livelihoods, that central problem of, of um, resources? I'm thinking also uh, Dr. Marsha talked about how she has solar panels and batteries because she owns her home and the person next door to her doesn't own their home and therefore they get $250 monthly energy bills while she has a $50 a year bill. And Dr. Raj yesterday mentioned 
the a sign of gentrification is uh, a new house that has solar panels and a Tesla. Mm -hmm. So again, it comes down to the question of, of, you know, what is our role in addressing that question of livelihoods, that flow of resources? I was asked by somebody, oh, aren't you, isn't your NGO just creating another dependency? And, I, and, I, and in recent days, I've thought, oh, you mean as opposed to the tra dependency on narco trafficking? Sure. Well, thank th you. Thank you. So I think that's an interesting question. We're just about time, but maybe someone can uh, comment this issue about livelihood, maybe uh, the just transition kind of framework. I'm not sure if anyone. Yeah, yeah. So I, I know we're out of time. So a uh, really powerful question. Yes. I think, you know, you know, again, the social terms of health, economic determinants of health is really important. I mean, environmental justice at, the, at its heart is the economic justice movement. When Dr. King was assassinated, you know, when he was in Memphis, think about the sanitation worker strike. He was moving to a poor people's campaign. Reverend Barber has continued the poor people's campaign. We have to, we have to address uh, economic opportunity structures. And with the Justice 40 initiative and just energy transition, not just people gonna lose their fossil fuel jobs, it's just an example. But what about people who have never been able to get in the fossil fuel you know, economy? But for those who are getting the clean energy infrastructure, how we can make sure we can benefit and that the communities who've been dumped on, extracted from, they should deserve, they should get the clean energy stuff first. So, those at the front line should be at the front of the line with those investments, and this is the U.S. context, but creating opportunity, creating energy sovereignty. That should be the framework when it comes to clean energy, clean energy sovereignty, to move away from fossil fuels and, and also across a supply chain. And I think that will lead to some of these ec economic justice and deal with, as we talked before, uh, that, that, that long-term economic inequality that we see in the country that has to be part of the multi-pronged approach and emphasizing we have to get to you know economic equality. So I'll stop there. I know we're over time. Thank you. Great. Thank you for this amazing panel. I think we've really pushed the envelope of being a little bit more explicit about what an intersectional and justice-oriented approach to climate change should entail. So thank you for this opportunity. And I'll turn it over to Amanda, who will give uh, instructions about the breakout sessions happening next. Thank you.